Hi listeners, this is the 80,000 Hours Podcast, where each week we have an unusually in-depth conversation about the world's most pressing problems and how you can use your career to solve them. I'm Rob Wiblin, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. Today's episode is going to be a cracker for those of you who are interested in using evidence, social programs, economics, or ending poverty. I talked to Dr. Rachel Glenister, who is currently the Chief Economist at the UK's Department for International Development, otherwise known as DFID. Before that, she was the Executive Director of the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab, popularly known as JPAL, from around its founding in 2004 until the start of 2018. I was due to interview Dr. Glenister on stage at Effective Altruism Global London, but sadly, I spoke to so many people at the conference that I actually lost my voice before I could do it. Fortunately, though, Nathan LeBenz was a real hero and at the last minute took my notes up on stage to fill in for me. So the first 28 minutes are Nathan's interview with Dr. Glenister at that event. Luckily, I was able to find an hour with Rachel once my voice had come back to ask some questions that Nathan didn't get to, follow up on some surprising things she said at the event, and find out more about what approaches to ending poverty she thinks are most underrated. Many of you will have listened to episode 30 with Dr. Eva Vivaldt. If so, you can especially look forward to Rachel offering a quite different interpretation of the results ever outlined in that episode. Just before all of that, though, I want to draw attention to two other podcasts you might be interested in subscribing to. Vox.com recently started an effective altruism-focused podcast called Future Perfect. It goes along with a whole new effective altruism-focused section on their site, also called Future Perfect. Blogger Kelsey Piper recently joined that team, and she's been writing some really great stuff. Today, for example, she wrote about why socially responsible investment is probably overrated. The host of the podcast, though, is my friend and journalist Dylan Matthews. The episodes are about 20 minutes and cover a wide range of topics. In the first season, they looked at opportunities to improve the world through humane fish slaughter, open borders, geoengineering, voluntary organ donation, and putting lithium in everyone's tap water, among other things. You can subscribe by searching for Future Perfect in your podcasting app or going to vox.com slash futureperfect. The second is the Future of Life podcast, which focuses primarily on catastrophic threats to the future of humanity as a whole. Lately, it's been getting more similar to this show, featuring long-form interviews with experts on issues like technical AI safety research, moral philosophy, accidental nuclear war, and climate change. The co-founder of Effective Altruism, Professor Will McCaskill, who many of you will be familiar with from episode 17, was recently on that show discussing moral uncertainty and its relevance to AI alignment. You can subscribe to that one by searching for Future of Life in your podcasting app. Okay, back to the interview with Dr. Rachel Glenister. As I said, Rachel is now Chief Economist at the UK's aid agency, DFID, and before that spent many years leading the famous research institute known as JPAL, based in the MIT Economics Department. Her research has included randomised evaluations of community-driven development in Sierra Leone, empowerment of adolescent girls in Bangladesh, and health, education and microfinance in India. Rachel also happens to have been one of the founding members of Giving What We Can, pledging 10% of her income to the most effective charities that she could find. So now I bring you Rachel Glenister, interviewed first by Nathan Lebenz and then by me. Thank you for being here. Very excited to have this conversation. What are you working on at the moment and why do you think it's especially important? So I'm doing lots of different work at DFID, but let me talk a little bit about some research work I'm doing, which is evaluating a mass media campaign, a radio campaign run by uh, Development Media International, which is um, an NGO here in the UK, and they are doing a family planning program on radio in Burkina Faso. So I think it's really important to look at uh, radio and mass media because it's a very cheap way to reach a large number of people and you can make sure that the message is accurate uh, and consistent. The problem is that it's very hard to evaluate radio for exactly those reasons because one radio program reaches millions of people at the same time so it's very hard to randomize. Now it happens that Burkina Faso is kind of one of the few places in the world where one can evaluate this effectively. It's also true that at DFID we're we're worrying a lot about the Sahel. Um, It's an area that hasn't had a lot of UK interest until recently and also family planning um, is a hugely important issue because if you get the demographic transition right it can have incredible benefits for women, for economic development and for the health of, of, of children. So why is it that that is more testable in Burkina Faso? Is that a language group issue? So it's a complex series of factors that means that the you have a lot of different radio stations across Burkina Faso and the 
indeed have different languages, so there's kind of less spillover. And so you can randomize at the level of the radio station. You also have people who are so poor that they can't afford radios. So we're randomly handing out radios to women who don't have radios. So we have kind of two levels of randomization, both at the radio station and within, within a radio area. Some women already have radios, some women are given radios and some aren't. So it's kind of a conglomeration of things that allow you to be able to test. How would you sketch the kind of intellectual trajectory of aid and development work over the last three decades? I think it's worth looking at two different trajectories. So there's the trajectory of the aid sector or the development sector, and then there's the trajectory of the kind of academic research on development. And those are a bit different. And one of the nice things about RCTs is they've brought those two really closely together. I think the trajectory of the aid sector has been one in which there was not enough emphasis, in my view, about understanding really rigorously what works. So there was a lot of different theories and views about what we should be doing. Um, And you see these big swings and fads between you know, the view that development was mainly about investment in physical capital. You know, we should, uh, the reason for aid is just that countries don't have enough investment. And so we should be building stuff. And, you know, the places like India had five-year plans and they built steel factories. And then there was a big swing saying, no, we need to worry about human capital and not just, you know, steel and because we can grow, but but people aren't benefiting, people aren't, you know, they're not, they're still malnourished, they're not learning. And and you see, you know, you see these big swings in interest about what we should be doing for development. And not a, not a lot of it was very based on, on data. And there has been a really big change in the last 10 years or so, especially within DFID and within the World Bank, to really seriously think about what is the evidence behind behind the decisions that we're making. And one of the reasons I moved to DFID is it's, it has been one of the aid agencies that has, I think, changed the most to constantly be questioning ourselves. So we're going through that whole process at the moment of saying, you know, looking at what we're doing and saying, is it really evidence-based? What's the new research say? What stuff should we stop doing? Because the, evidence, the new evidence is saying we shouldn't be doing that. And that really is, a, is an important sea change in, in the aid world. Within, within academia, where most of the RCTs are happening, I think RCTs are part of a much bigger change, which is about, again, thinking carefully about what's the causal effect. So there was a lot of, a lot of work on descriptive, uh, you know, descriptively what's happening in, in developing countries, which I think is really important. There was a, quite a lot of kind of focus on ideology, I think, which I think there's been some move away from. But to be honest, just not a lot of work happening on development. One of the biggest changes in uh, research uh, in academia and economics is just there are a lot more people thinking about the developing world. And that's great. And a lot of them are doing RCTs. But if you look at the the data, actually, there's just as much non-RCT work as there was before. There's now more RCT work and there's just more people development was kind of a bit off the side and it was you know people thought about different issues and what people have realized is the questions in development are actually very similar to the questions in other bits of economics and we should be learning from each other so you've so you've seen things that have been discovered in the developing world like you know a lot of behavioral economics lessons came from development and are now being taken up and used and learned from in rich countries and i think that better integration of development into, you know, understanding that we're all the same and there are a lot of similarities and a lot to learn. I think that's been really important to see that uh, lessons going in both directions. So moving to RCTs in general and sort of the state of debate around how much we should rely upon them, you mentioned that it's kind of a 50-50 split right now in today's work. Do you think that's an appropriate split? Do you think that it should be all RCTs, uh, what do you think is kind of the right balance as we try to figure out what is obviously a very complicated world? I think it's really important to say that 
all of us who have worked on randomized trials have never suggested that this is the only methodology that you should use. Sometimes it's held up as a straw person that, you know, we go around saying this is the only methodology and, you know, people criticize us for saying it's the only methodology, but nobody who's done RCTs has ever thought that that's the the right approach. I think the right way to see things is you have a toolbox of ways to answer questions and the right tool depends on the question that you're asking. So I think we need good descriptive work to understand what the problems are. Like a lot of development programs just fail because they're trying to solve a problem that doesn't exist. They're just solving the wrong problem. So the first really important thing you've got to do is really understand what the issue is in any given area. So, you know, if we're worried about girls not going to school because of menstruation, well, let's start by finding out whether they actually don't go to school more when they're menstruating. Like that's a kind of really basic, obvious thing, but we actually need more work on that kind of Understanding your context, understanding the problem is really important first step. So when I started doing agriculture work in Sierra Leone, the first thing we did was work with the government to kind of do a really detailed analysis of what are the problems for smallholder farmers in Sierra Leone. Not RCT, just kind of descriptive. And it turned up all sorts of interesting facts that kind of people weren't aware of. So I think that's really important. I think then doing an RCT is useful for answering a really specific problem, a really specific question. But I think the best RCTs are ones that test a theory. So they test something that's more generalizable than just this, does this program work? It's asking a question about human beings. Here's an example. So I did a project looking at how to improve immunization rates in India, which was fantastically effective. It started with a first assessment of what are the health problems in this area. And only 3% of kids in this part of India were getting fully immunized. And given that immunization is one of the most effective things that you could do, you know, that, that rate is just appallingly low. So there were a number of theories about why that could be. And a lot of people said, well, people here don't trust the doctors. They don't, or not doctors, because you rarely get doctors in rural India or rural anywhere, uh, but nurses in clinics. So they don't trust the formal health system. There was also a question of, so the clinics are often closed. So is that the problem? Like, is it that when you go and take your kid to the clinic, it's often closed? Is it nurse absenteeism that's the problem? Or is it just a behavioral economics thing that you're happy to get your kid immunized, but you'll do it tomorrow? So we, you know, we'd read all this behavioral economics and we said, well, maybe we should look at that. But we also wanted to test these other ideas. So one arm um, made sure that without fail, there was someone to immunize your child. And another arm um, did that, but also provide a small incentive. So yes, we were testing a program, but we were also asking a more fundamental question, which is, why don't people get their kids immunized? And what we saw in the data is a lot of people got their kid immunized with one immunization, but they failed to persist to the end of the schedule, which already that's just descriptive data. And it starts to tell you it's not that they distrust the system or that they think that immunizations are evil because they're getting the kid one immunization it's more a question of persistence now fixing the supply problem increased the number of people getting the first shot and the second shot but again it failed to fix this persistence problem where the incentive effect worked was it helped people persist to the end and so that tells you that one of the big problems was this persistence problem and it tells you a lot about why immunization isn't happening. Now that project was completely impossible to scale, right? We were handing out lentils in the middle of Rajasthan where like nobody showed up and it was just, you would never, this was like economists designing logistics. It was a disaster. I mean, <laughs> we learned a lot, but you would never want to actually do a program like this. And a colleague of mine did, you know, something similar where another program in Rajasthan where we ended up, you know, improving teachers' attendance by having cameras that were like wrapped in seller tape and signed. I, like, again, it was like the logistics was a nightmare, but it tested a theory. And so once you have that, you can think about what's the implementation issues. How do we implement this at scale? Because you 
better understand the problem. You want to use an RCT when you can test a specific problem and get an answer to why something is an issue. It's an important question. You can answer it well, and it has broader implications. But you also use to, uh, need to use other types of methodology when your question is of a different kind. Tyler Cowen, who was a recent guest on the 80,000 Hours podcast, just published a book in which he basically argues that the number one focus should be on economic growth. That's where almost all of the good that we enjoy comes from, subject uh, to some constraints based on just general human rights. Uh, I think he has a pretty intuitive approach to what exactly that definition is. But it seems like you would kind of broadly agree with the emphasis on growth. At the same time, some have argued that the focus on RCTs and sort of uh, what you know has been called the aid effectiveness craze, quote unquote, is focusing our attention on small issues that maybe are distracting from the bigger questions of broad economic growth and kind of progress in these societies. So do you think that is a valid worry? And, and how do you square those, those two kind of levels of a very small and just society-wide capability building? So I think there's a, a number of different things going on here. One I first need to object to, which is the characterization of RCTs as aid effectiveness. So most of the work on RCTs has not been focused on aid. And I think it's really important to understand this difference, which is most of the money that goes into poverty relief is money spent by people in developing countries, governments and individuals. And actually, if you look at most of the people doing RCTs, they don't think that their audience is aid donors. Their audience is the government of India and the government of Brazil and the government of Indonesia and to some extent big companies or other individuals there because that's where the money is to be honest so let's just remember there's aid and there's development and aid is only ever one small part of development I do agree that improving the policies of developing country governments is a hugely important way to impact global poverty. So the RCT craze is not about aid effectiveness, it's about government effectiveness, <laughs> poverty effectiveness. So that's one slight quibble. <laughs> then there's kind of the heart of your question, which is policy versus working on small questions. Do RCTs work on small questions? And then there's how do we think about development versus, say, working on improving someone's health or education now? Again, those are, I think, two different questions. So I think, actually, RCT should not be seen as looking at, at testing this specific program. They should be seen as testing big questions that can then influence policy. For example, you might test a specific project on, on education. You know, a lot of the work on education has suggested that the most effective thing that we can do in education is to focus on the learning within the classroom. It's not about more money. It's not about more textbooks. It's not about... And that's what governments spend their money on. They spend it on teachers and textbooks mainly teachers, but more teachers doesn't actually improve learning. More textbooks doesn't improve learning. But that's what the Indian government is spending their money on. So if I want to help the Indian government on education, I want to test those different things about how the Indian government could improve their education and then help them reform the education system. And what this set of RCTs has suggested is not just that it's about the pedagogy, but it's specifically about the problem that the Indian curriculum is up here and most kids are here. So if you look at the data, there's just descriptive data, again, the power of descriptive data. Within a kind of average Indian classroom in ninth grade, none of the kids are even close to ninth, the ninth grade curriculum. They're testing it somewhere between second grade and sixth grade. Now, no wonder they're not learning very much because the teacher, the only thing that a teacher has to do by law in India is complete the curricula. Even if the kids have no idea what they're talking about. So yes, you had 
RCTs testing very specific interventions, all of the ones that worked were ones that got the teaching down from the ninth grade curriculum to a level that the kids could actually understand. Now, the lesson from that, the big lesson to the Indian government, if they were ever to agree to this, is change your curriculum. Like, that's the biggest thing that you could do. Reform the curriculum and make it more appropriate to what children are doing. So, yes, you're testing little things, but you're coming out with big answers. Now, the final part, and I think the hardest part is economic development versus, say, working on health and education. And, you know, at DFID, we have shifted a lot of emphasis relatively recently into trying to do more on economic transformation under the recognition that the biggest reductions in poverty, as you say, have come from big transformations in economic policy. So the big opening up of India and China towards more market-oriented economies, and I'm not saying markets solve everything, they absolutely don't. But when you've got, when you've got a system as screwed up as communist China, making prices have some influence <laughs> moves you an awful lot of way, an awful long way, and can really help transform the economy. And the same happened in India. And you saw massive reductions in poverty by just sort of a move towards a slightly more sensible economic policy. So when I was recently doing my kind of ranking of what are kind of the most effective things that DFID could do, we were saying, well, if there are cases of countries that are kind of as screwed up as China, helping them move to a more effective economic management, that's got to be the most effective thing that we could do for poverty. You can't do that as an outside donor unless someone's willing to do it. So where you see, you know, I'd say Ethiopia at the moment is going through a tremendous reform. And we really ought to be focusing attention and helping Ethiopia in that transition. Tremendous potential because they're absolutely fundamentally changing policy there in ways that could be really beneficial to the poor. So jump on those opportunities, but you can't really make them happen. That's something that the developing country themselves has to decide to do. Then help them as much as you can. Then there's the question of what do you do to promote economic development in countries that aren't kind of going through this kind of fundamental reform process. You can nudge them a bit in the right way. You can maybe help improve trade policy. You can help reduce trade barriers. There's things that you can do. But in a lot of countries, it's not entirely obvious what you can do to promote economic development. We need a lot more research, a lot more understanding about how to do that, because I absolutely agree that it's fundamental. But we don't always have all the tools that we need to make economic transformation happen. Now, think about our own economies and our own. It's not that we only ever worry about economics development. We also worry about health and education, right? Because we don't grow in order to have more money. We grow to have better lives. So we want to make sure that that money translates into actually better lives. So we need to be thinking about poverty relief domestically, you know, within developing countries, health and education. And, there's, and we know a lot about how to do that well. So we need both to take the opportunities for economic development growth when we can and really come in there heavily where there's an opportunity. But we also need to be working on health and education, not least because we know that those things are really important for economic development. We know that there's, a, there's high productivity improvements if kids are given the right nutrition early on. There's about a 10% return to investing in education. You know, to some extent, you can't have economic transformation without the building blocks of human capital. You know, in the classic economic growth model, there's human capital, people, and physical capital. If you want growth, you need to be working on all of those things. I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't get to the overrated, underrated quick hit list. I'm Tyler Cowan, and I approve this use of overrated and underrated. And so I'll give you a number of prompts and you can respond with overrated or underrated. And of course, you're free to pass on any of them if you don't have a strong view or would rather just avoid the topic. So the first one, uh, overrated, underrated, charter cities as a means of promoting the sort of growth that we're talking about. I'm not a fan of charter cities, <laughs> I don't, but I don't think anyone else is either, apart from, you know, one Nobel Prize winner. How about going along to get along with your colleagues? 
So I think it's really important to learn how to influence and how to get along with your colleagues if you're going to make change. So uh, underrated. Starting a business in the developing world. Uh, probably underrated. Social entrepreneurship, overrated. Business, underrated. And how would you draw a line between those? So social entrepreneurship is small things that you help, you know, developing a, you know, a solar torch to, you know, sell to people. Many of those do not take off in a big way, partly because people don't have a lot of money. Uh, and I think you could have a much bigger impact by working in big organizations. I do think that there's a lot of evidence that businesses in the developing world are really badly managed. And there's a lot of improvements that could be made. And basically, people want jobs. So they don't want money to create their own businesses. They want jobs. So managing to get good, effective private sector businesses working in these countries is is really important. Now, whether this audience is, you know, well-placed to run those companies is a question. But I know people who've spent many years in development, you know, do, working as NGOs or working as RAs for me who, you know, set up businesses. And I think that's great. How about cash transfers? So cash transfers, I think, were very high appropriately. People have been a little bit down on them recently because of some recent work saying maybe the long-term impacts of one of them wasn't as much as people had hoped. But I think when you look at the literature as a whole, I think it's very positive, including on the long-term benefits. And even if the control group catches up, getting people out of poverty earlier is still really beneficial. <laughs> so... Once Again, was been, appropriately so, rated, now underrated. Uh, but, yeah, exactly. Was appropriately rated, now per, perhaps um, underrated. Okay. How about gene drives for mosquito and other disease vector control? Okay, I'm going to pass on that. I don't know enough about that. Maybe this one as well. Uh, genetically modified and CRISPR crops. So I don't know about CRISPR crops, but I'm a big fan of GM crops and particularly just improved agricultural varieties in the developing world hugely beneficial. Now, some of that you can get without GM, but I, I think we're probably a little bit paranoid about GM. How about cracking down on tax havens or other sources of illicit financial flows? Underrated. So we should do more of that. <laughs> uh, what's, what's the mechanism by which that benefits everyone? So a huge amount of money flows out of developing countries into tax havens. So it's not really about developed world tax havens. It's also a big problem in terms of fueling corruption. We in the West, there's a big opportunity for exposing the bad deals that are done with uh, bad governments in developing countries uh, that are often done in the West. And we have a huge culpability for that, and we ought to be doing more to stop it. And I'm pleased to say that DFID is doing more work on that. Micronutrient supplementation. So micronutrients underrated. Supplementation, we still need more work on that because it's the way we're putting micronutrients out at the moment doesn't seem to be working very well. So anemia is probably underrated. It's a huge, huge problem. It really affects productivity. It affects cognition. It's a major problem. We haven't quite figured out how to get, how to address it though. So problem is underrated. Solution needs a lot more work. Reforming developing country macroeconomic policy. Yeah. So macroeconomic policy is really important, but we've actually kind of figured it out. Like, if you look at inflation, it used to be a major problem. When I was doing development economics, half of the course was about how to deal with hyperinflation. Virtually nobody has hyperinflation anymore. It's, really, it's a real major success that we don't talk about enough. So it's really important, but we uh, maybe I shouldn't, uh, if you're suspicious, I shouldn't say this, but uh, we kind of nailed it. Okay, a couple more. How about pre-registration? I think that's overrated. And that's a little funny coming from me because I wrote one of the papers saying that we ought to do more of it in economics. I'm now finding some of the downsides. <laughs> yeah, there's a big move to do to pre-register in advance what your analysis is going to be. And sometimes tying your hands is not actually a good idea. So pre-registering that you're doing a study is really important. 
pre-analysis plans which say this is exactly how I'm going to analyze my data when it comes out can be a problem because when you look at the data and stuff has happened in between, it may be really important to change how you do your analysis. Plus, I've found referees hate it, so <laughs> that's probably less of an issue for this audience. Do you think that people are not doing that extended analysis or that it's being just unfairly dismissed as a result of the pre-registration? I understand that people um, worry that you run a trial and then you test it, test your results on like 50 different um, outcomes and you promote the one that, that had a positive effect. Most academic work doesn't work quite like that because you would never, you know, your referees force you to show you, show, you know, 50 robustness checks and, <laughs> and you don't get past if only one of them had a positive effect. I think we need to rely a bit more on theory. Like theory tells you which things should go together, which things should be important. And I think theory can be as an effective way of kind of looking at the data and pulling out patterns and is a bit of tying your hands and might be a more effective way of tying your hands than, than pre-analysis plans. I'm not saying you should never do them. I just, they're not the simple answer that people thought they were. Okay. How about reading the news or the newspaper? So reading the news of the kind that, that you already support, we should be doing less of. <laughs> reading things that shock you out of your, you know, that, that comes from a different perspective, I think is, you know, we don't do enough of. So I try and read about African politics, for example. It's not on our news normally, but it's really interesting. So reading, reading the news from like serious people who cover African politics, I find, you know, really helpful in just kind of bringing a different perspective. And my son is, is brilliant at saying, you know, a kind of pushing to say, you know, read what people of different political opinion are saying, just to keep your horizons broader. But I think often when we read the news, we read the things that kind of confirm what we already know, and that's not very helpful. Okay, thanks so much to Nathan for doing such a great job filling in for me with no notice. We pick up now with me speaking to Rachel three days later in her office in London. Earlier this year, I spoke with Eva Vivaut about generalizability of RCTs. And uh, she had this kind of uh, archetypal stylized fact that, in, at least in her sample, the typical result differs from the average effect found in similar studies so far by about 100%, which is to say that if all existing studies of an education program find that it improves test scores by 0.5 standard deviations, the next result in her sample was as likely to be negative or greater than one standard deviation as it is uh, to be between zero and one standard deviations. But I guess... Uh, you, th you think that uh, Eva is potentially like overstating uh, like the implications that this has and how dire the situation is for external uh, validity of, of RCTs. What's your general perspective on this? Yeah, so I think it's really important to distinguish the different causes of why a different study might have a different result. Because we take away different conclusions, we act differently depending on the reason for why a different study might have a different result. So one reason why a uh, second study might have a different result is the problem didn't exist there. So then I'm not at all surprised that you have a different finding uh, in another study. It doesn't worry me at all. A second reason why you might have a different effect in the second study is it's implemented less well. In the first study, you had 80% take up and the second study had 20% take up, right? So again, you don't want to just compare the results of the two studies. You would then want to adjust for take up in those contexts. And the third reason is that just people behave really differently, right? In different contexts. And that's the, that in a sense is the assumption behind saying this is, you know, a problem. And I guess my reading of the evidence is that actually most of the variation between studies that we see is either they're actually implementing a completely different kind of program <laughs> and we don't have enough studies so we bundle a whole bunch of things that are completely different together and then it's no wonder we get different results or it, the implementation was really different and bad or really good. And that just tells us, well, we need to really work on implementation. It might tell us really important things about 
this is a really hard thing to implement. And that's a really useful lesson. It's not really about generalizability. Generalizability for me means people act differently when they've faced the same problem and they're given the same incentives, but they respond to those incentives really differently. And my reading of the RCT evidence is that actually we get surprisingly similar results, if anything, across across different studies. Yeah, so you have this um, a really nice article in the uh, SSIR, which we'll put up a link to, which readers can read, which kind of lays out your view and gives like lots of uh, specific specific cases. I guess it seems like the, the implicit claim here is that if you were able to see how well the replication was being implemented and you like knew something about the situation, then you would be able to predict ahead of time like what, whether you would expect to get the similar result as in uh, previous studies or, or not. Do you know of any evidence of people who have actually tried to do that, to run an experiment where they've tried to see whether they can predict ahead of time? Because I mean, the fact that the, like, there were these trials being run that got like negative or very different results suggests that at least some of the time people couldn't predict that it wasn't going to work in this other context, at least not ahead of doing the experiment. Yeah. So there's two parts to those to that question. The first is, is there a methodology we can use? And yeah, absolutely, there is. And I we haven't used it so much. But in a recent study I've done, it's maybe not exactly what you're talking about, but in a recent study I've done, we asked for priors at the beginning, right? So before, actually, before we got the results, we asked you know, different kinds of people, what they expected the result to be. In this case, it was a long-term follow-up. So people were shown the original result and then they say, what do you think the result would be, you know, in five years' time? But other people have done it. Uh, Stefan de, de Lavigno has done a nice study where he sort of asked people what you would expect to find in this kind of study and shows, you know, who's good at predicting and what what people are good at predicting. Uh, go see that, you know, he asked people what you expect to find and then he runs the study. I think we should be doing a lot more of that. Yeah. Um, I'm hoping that we will start doing it. Uh, we did it as a response to uh, Stefan's paper and so hopefully other people will also pick that up because one off, that's not enough. But if we get enough studies, that's quite useful. The other thing is, do we know whether something would be implemented well beforehand and oughtn't we to know that? So it's quite interesting. Some, so some of the psychology literature actually shows that there's a lot of information in people's heads about what things will replicate and what won't, right? And it's not in the paper necessarily, but if you ask experts, they're like, oh, that, that study will replicate and that won't. And they're quite good at predicting. Yeah, there was a beautiful replication piece in science that came out a few months ago, uh, which showed that, yeah, psychologists were extremely good at predicting which papers were actually going to replicate and which weren't, um, even though they were all published in like, the, the same quality journals. Right. And so, so somehow I think that does suggest that the experts, you know, there's some information that somehow isn't in the papers about, you know, uh, that people understand whether this thing is replicable or not. I don't take exactly the same conclusion as you do that people aren't good at knowing whether something's going to work. I think often we're doing trials of risky things in risky places. <laughs> Part of what we're trying to do is work through the logistics of trying to design, so trying to design things which are then easy to scale up. So, you know, the first step is to test whether something works when it's implemented extremely well. And then the next step is, okay, can I reproduce that result in a, a more scalable version? That didn't work, so let's try it another way. So it's kind of a process where at the end we're kind of iterating onto something that should be more consistently able to work at scale. And my slight concern with what Eva does is she sort of throws all of those things into one pot and kind of does, runs a regression. And when those different studies were trying to do really different things. Some of them were trying to say, how would this work if you did it extremely well, you know, with the best implementer and you paid really close attention? And the other one is, would this work if we had a crap implementer? <laughs> or, you know, so, so yes, in those cases, you would expect it to be really different. And often that's exactly the question that you're going to test. And it's not that it's a failure. It's a learning, like you've learned that no, this kind of implementer can't do do it. That doesn't mean the first study was wrong. It means we've got to try another implementation strategy. Do you agree that uh, Eva's results are at least to show that if you were going to be like, you can't really do the very naive thing of just looking at the average effect size across a bunch of studies and then saying, well, that like if I run this again somewhere else, like 
without even being an expert in how to run this program, it will like have a similar outcome. They, they, it does show that that would be, a, be an error of judgment, yeah. Although perhaps no, nobody's, nobody's silly enough to do that. <laughs> well, this is one of the reasons why I think we have to be quite careful when we do meta-analyses, because some of them are just kind of throwing everything together and, uh, you know, you've got different levels of take-up and it's actually, you know, the, the objective of the study wasn't really to test that thing. And so you need quite a lot of judgment, more judgment to do a good meta-analysis than I think people realize. Yeah. So uh, it seems like often with an intervention, there aren't that many different studies uh, testing how well it works in different places. And it seems like you might then be kind of underpowered to figure out what the contextual factors are that matter, at least using that method. It seems like you're going to have to use a lot of judgment based on your experience on the ground of what things are likely to matter and also just your prior priors about what things are likely to matter in different places. Is, is that right? So I think the I think the way we should think about this is... We look at these studies, and th this again is set out in more detail in my SSIR paper, but, but let me try and summarize that, which is we have very few studies that test exactly the same thing in lots of different contexts. We have quite a lot of studies that are testing some fundamental underlying principle about human behavior. The trick is then to take that fundamental principle about human behavior, which we've tested many times and now know to be true, and think about how to implement that in the local context. And that could be about, you know, offering lentils in one context and, you know, ice cream in another, <laughs> right? It's, but those things don't need to be tested by RCTs, right? Some of that is about, it is knowing your context, but it's just, it's uh, basic logistics. And some of the basic logistics we do need to test every single time, but we don't test with an RCT, right? You test with good monitoring processes. So it's like saying, I know there have been enough studies that I know if I hang a bed net, it will work. I'm not going to test that again. I'm going to test. Do they hang did, them up here? Did they hang them up, right? So. Which is probably a lot easier to test. Much, much easier to test. Uh, so it's, it's, Doing that causal pathway and saying which bits do we, which bits are making sure that that you've analysed the problem right that they actually have malaria. <laughs> the next step is you know if you give that people have tested is if you give malaria bed nets for free you know normally you get higher take up and people are most likely to hang them. But the third thing is how do we make sure that we have a monitoring system that the malaria bed nets actually get out to people and also maybe test. Occasionally, you know, that they're hanging them up. But that doesn't need an RCT. That's good monitoring. If you need a lot of uh, trials to kind of establish a stylized fact about how humans behave, how many things have we learned of that kind? It seems like it might be a fairly, fairly short list if you need like dozens of studies to, to figure out that something just recurs like in, in most cultures and most countries and most situations. Is, is there kind of a list of like these things that we've learned, these like underlying principles that we use whenever we develop any program at all? Well, maybe not every program, but I we know that people are very sensitive to price and convenience in the take up of of healthcare right so never charge for preventative healthcare like that's a pretty big darn you know policy conclusion but we've got <laughs> a lot of different studies that point towards that so in the health field there are a number around this you know price and convenience type of things and then in education i think we've learned this more general lesson from many, many studies that it's really about, it's not about the inputs, it's about the teaching, how people teach. And the biggest problem in most developing countries is that the teaching is way above the heads of most of the kids. So they're on grade two, you're teaching them at grade six, right? That's a pretty fundamental thing, which, you know, we've got a lot of progress, a lot of, that's going to come into a lot of different education programs to use that principle. People respond to incentives. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the I, price goes up. People buy less. Yeah. yeah. So, so there's quite a lot of, um, you know, I'm not going to remember all of them off the top of my head. Um, to do a plug for my old uh, organization, JPAL, uh, the last thing I did before I left was bang heads together of the various academics working in an area. And they, of course, they love to kind of put caveats on everything, but say, okay, what are the main cross-cutting principles that have come out of RCTs in your area. So those are called policy insight notices, and you can go to JPAL, and under each one, they will at least list three, 
like common cross-cutting principles that they found. So in agriculture, in, in health, in education, in governance. So that will give you a list of some of those. So it's, for most of them, it's not more than about three, but they are quite general. This potentially like makes RCTs look like substantially better value if you can come up with these um, yeah, principles that are going to apply to basically every other program in the area in future. Because like, well, they, not they are every. I don't want to overdo it. Not yeah, every okay. other program, but well, but you at least know. something that you might want to consider in most cases. Um, yes. Because yeah, I guess sometimes people worry that oh, you know, each RCT is quite expensive, and then you know, to test all of the programs that we might consider ever running is just prohibitively expensive. But if you can find yeah these underlying principles, then it's like of, of like much much broader value. Yeah. So I think that's a point that people really really get confused about, which is the more academic and abstract the RCT, in some ways, the more policy relevant it is, <laughs> which sounds really odd <laughs> and counterintuitive. But the point is, an RCT that tries to test one of these fundamental principles of human behavior is actually much more useful. Because if you're just testing a package of things and you can't really tell an underlying principle from it, you're you know, testing whether these six things together have an effect. You can't take that to another context. You can't learn as much from it as if you're, you go in deliberately saying, okay, my question is not, does this work? But are people price sensitive in this area? Do people use something more if they pay for it? Like I'm testing this more general principle that's more generalizable and it's better value for money. So there's like a lot of different potential sources of heterogeneity, like you know, differences in culture or like differences in the quality of implementation or the fact that a program was different in some ways that like aren't really getting picked up in this, in this meta-analysis and also just like random noise, of course. Do you think that any of these is like underrated as, as how significant it is or how much like um, variability it creates? So I think implementation quality is something that people don't take into account enough, but that varies by the kind of program, right? I think what we ought to be doing is looking, if someone's taking a deworming pill, there's not that much difference in the quality of the pill usually, right? <laughs> the quality is very easy to measure in that did someone take it, right? But if you're talking about a training, or, you know, graduation program, then it really matters. So I think we should be looking at, you know, when we do these meta-analyses, using our theory to say, is this something where the quality is going to matter, quality of implementation is going to matter, or is it not? Do you think we potentially deliver too many programs where the quality of implementation matters? Like, I guess it, that, that can potentially reduce the expected value quite a lot just because there's a high chance you're going to screw it up. So I'm, I'm a big fan of, in general, unless you've got a really good evidence against this, of you know, doing less complicated programs, fewer components, and just doing one thing well massively. Like I think that's a huge problem that we try lots and lots and lots of different things. And I don't mean test lots of things because we want to test lots of things to find the one really good cost-effective thing. And then we should scale that up massively. And we don't do that enough. And that's one of the things I've been saying within Diffit, by the way. So I saw this uh, paper that came out last year, which said that about 90%, 95% of papers published in development economics were, were empirical. Do you think that that's potentially too high, given that it sounds like you think there's a substantial role for like people having theories about you know what things work and how people behave? Maybe like the, the empirical revolution has gone like a, bit, <laughs> a little bit too far. So actually what I think is happening, so if I remember that paper right, they count as empirical anything that has an empirical element in it. Okay. So it's like too general, or too, a very expansive so definition. What you see a lot, and I suffer from this myself because I don't do theory in the sense of, like in a paper theory is math, right? It's a, it's a mathematical model. It's not, I've been using theory to mean kind of, you know, thinking about general principles you know, and both are true, like, a, you know, a mathematical model is just a way of formalizing those general principles. What you see, what the trend has been, is to neither have purely theory papers, or purely empirical papers. What you're seeing a lot more of is papers that have both theory and empirics. And that I think is great, even though it makes my life harder at the moment, I'm in the process of adding mathematical models to two what were purely empirical papers. But it's really 
pushing me to understand my empirics better and realizing that our results in one of our papers was actually really quite counterintuitive and against all the other models out there where it felt kind of like quite an intuitive result when we first got it. But then when when somebody, when a reviewer said, no, 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 I want to see a model behind this, we realized that it actually was counter to the standard models in the, in the literature. So I think that's exactly pushes us to do what I've been saying, which is go backwards and forwards between the empirical and the theory. And that used to be in economics, that would happen, but one set of people would write the theory and another set of people would do the empirics and hopefully they were going backwards and forwards, but it wasn't in the same paper. So the trend you're seeing, I think, is less theory on its own and more kind of combined papers. And I think that's great. Yeah, just coming back to the question of whether people can predict um, which which program is going to work in other situations. So yeah, when that science paper came out with the uh, twenty or was it twenty one uh, social science papers and uh, t- testing whether they could predict, I actually made a quiz on our website where people could test their own ability to predict whether the, the papers would replicate. And this was of course after the replications had come out, but most people yeah, not, they haven't read all the details, even if they read the headline, uh, they don't know which ones. So you, I wonder whether it's possible to go back retrospectively and like once you've done like replications or yeah, even after the fact, you can go back and see whether people can predict now which ones did replicate in the past. Or, or like, you know, yeah, how much things are transferred from one country to another. The thing is, in economics, we just don't have enough, like, actual pure replications. They're not replications in the way that that article that you're talking was, which was literally running the same thing. We just don't do that. We tend to be doing things that also predict that general theory, but it's done in a very different way. And then you could say, well... Yes, but then you can always reinterpret what you find and say, well, it didn't fit that theory because it wasn't implemented well or it wasn't, you know, actually the theory was different. But but I, but that's right, right? I mean, the, we, we changed the theory. So I think you can't do what they did in economics because we there's literally, there's microcredit and graduation program. And now there's, uh, you know, one on politics, which I all they're not happy with but there's kind of three sets where we've tried to do the same thing everywhere and i'm not sure that they always make sense to do that yeah but what about just trying to predict like the level of external validity from like one country to another or you know one implementing organization to another implementing organization not ex- not an exact replication we're predicting you know uh how much will the the impact transfer from one case to another is that, is that something that can be done I mean, that assumes that you're going to do it in the same way. Oh, well, no, 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 but I'm saying do it differently, but just say, well, you know, here's the result of this other thing. We're going to try to do it in this other case. It's going to be different in like these ways. And also it's a different country and the other people doing it, maybe they're like not as competent or something like that. Like, what do you think the impact will be on average uh, or like, yeah, of, of this new version? I think it, I think it would be really, as I say, I think it would be really interesting if people wrote down their priors beforehand, the researchers and the implementers. Uh, and it said, okay, I predict that this is going to be the impact. And if it's not, th- these are the things that are going to matter, right? Because you're not going to know whether there's a, you know, a hurricane or whatever. But the things that are going to matter are, you know, take up. I think take up is going to be good, but this is really going to, you know, my impact is going to be much less if take up is less or if, you know, absenteeism is high or what, you know, these are the three things that I think are the potential risks to this not having an impact. So I think I would do both. What's the prediction here? And these are the things that that prediction, these are the assumptions behind my prediction that take up will be high and this will be, you know, so if these don't follow through, that's why I wouldn't get the result. Uh, a really interesting thing with the with the quiz, uh, the, the social science uh, replication quiz that we put on our site was that we found that just total random people on the internet were equally as good at predicting the uh, replicability of papers as uh, like uh, as psychology professors were. Really? Uh, when you aggregated them, when you aggregated them both, yeah. So I was I was quite surprised by that because I tend to be like a kind of a pro expert person, but in this case, it's just. I mean, I don't expect that this would transfer over to development economics as much because in this case, often it was like people looking and then being like, uh, "Here's this priming experiment. Smells like nonsense. Like I don't really believe that." Um, and like both, like a normal person and a psychology professor can can both see this. Um, in this case, there might I don't know actually be more, be more expertise, uh, hopefully. Or like actually, I mean, hopefully not in a sense because if you could just take random people and like survey them on whether they think this experiment will replicate. Then that's ideal. It's a lot cheaper than running it again. Uh, like, and, and even better if they can also anticipate like where it will generalize to and where it won't. Um, yeah, I guess it's something that I, I would love to see more papers on that. And another thing, if we got more priors, we could start using more Bayesian statistics, which would be great. Yeah. Uh, do, do you want to paint a vision of how that might work? Um, 
No, but I am following closely some, you know, good economists who are thinking about this problem. Uh, when they la- when I last heard someone present on how we should be shifting to Bayesian e- uh, statistics and economics, they said, well, the minor problem is we can't put confidence intervals on it. And I'm like, until you can put confidence intervals, we can't use it. We can't use it. We won't get published. Because, we- yeah. Because we can't say whether the result, if you can't tell us how to say whether the result is significant, and they're like, no, but that's the whole point of Bayesian. Right, I see. That it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it does. They're trying to shoehorn it into frequentist uh, uh, statistics. Exactly. But but I just don't see how we are ever going to get published if we can't say something like that. Yeah. You can't do like a confidence interval on like the credences or something like that across people. I don't know. I don't know. That was the result I was told. (laughs) Interesting. And so I think we might be, it might be well. Yeah. I think we, we need some new Bayesian journals. Yes. Um, all right. Pushing on to a, to a question that, that really interests me and might be a bit of an indulgence. I'm not sure how much readers or uh, listeners are going to care. But um, uh, t- a year or two ago, we uh, tried to figure out the answer to this question of like how, what fraction of social interventions work? Because uh, we've been using this quote uh, from um, somebody whose name, uh, I think David Anderson, where he said like most social interventions like when tested don't work. And uh, we found that like the more we thought about this, the more it really depends on exactly what you mean by work and exactly what you mean by social intervention, as you might expect. It's like <laughs> um, we're really going down the down the wormhole. But I ended up concluding that like probably quite a lot more interventions work in some sense. Like that, on average, you'd expect them to have a positive impact. Maybe not in like every single implementation, but uh, and maybe not like a very large effect, not large enough to be detected in a small study. But like maybe even like more than half of st- uh, things, you know, have some positive impact in expectation. Do you have any view on this general question of like what should we say when we're thinking what fraction of social interventions? work and just perhaps the, the reason why this matters quite a bit is that uh, it's relevant to what kind of a gain you get from being empirical and uh, doing running rcts and, and measuring how things uh, well things work because if like if one uh, you know implement one uh, intervention out of 100 uh, had almost all of the impact of all of them then you get a huge benefit from measuring whereas if like half of them work and they're all like quite bunched together in how large their impact is then maybe you should just like save the money on measurement and just scale up more stuff so first of all i think it's really it's quite hard to draw conclusions about What fraction of things work by what fraction of studies show positive effects? Because, you know, we tend to test the new things. So if, you know, some things we don't test because we've tested them many times before and we know they work and so we don't test them anymore, right? So bed nets would be an example of that. Like we don't need to test the bed nets work anymore because that's done. So if you look at an existing supply of tests now, Hopefully not many of them are of bed nets because kind of that's done, Uh, except that we've got new bed nets coming along. But, you know, (laughs) just an example of something that we, you know, we know works. So the flow of tasks tend to be the new things. So that's one point. So you have to be a little bit careful about when you're trying to answer that question of thinking about your sample selection of what is tested. The second point is I really don't think it's about whether they work or not. It's more your point about the bunching. Right? Is it the case that most things will say when they work, they work in similar amounts? And that, I think, is empirically false. So there's some work that Michael Kremer's hopefully about to publish soon from looking at what uh, USAID invested in in innovation. And one of the problems in, in this kind of analysis is being able to look at all the things that, that were invested in like to make sure that you don't have a file draw problem of tests that were done and never published because they didn't find something, right? You want to make sure that you have the whole portfolio of things, of innovations that were funded to be able to look at kind of the range of outcomes. And what he finds from, from the work that he was involved in in USAID is that they funded a lot of different things. The impact all comes from a very few, only a few massively scaled And those are, you know, spectacularly effective and they reach a lot of people. And so I can't remember what the total number is, you know, 43 or 50 or something uh, things were invested in. But five pay for all of it. You know, you get a fantastic return, even if you assume that only five paid off. So when we've we've recently looked at this in terms, you know, when you look at cost effectiveness of things like on education, there were a ton of zeros and there were a ton of zeros of things that, you know, are actually what we mainly spend our money on. So more teachers, more books, more inputs, more, more smaller class sizes, at least in the developing world, 
have no impact. And that's where most of the money gets spent. But the top ones, the most cost-effective things are, you know, 460 lays per $100 spent. That is, so a lay is the new educational equivalent of a DALI, learning adjusted years of schooling. Uh, learning, a, so just like a DALI, it's based on kind of the highest quality. So a DALI is based on... Uh, a perfect year of education. Yeah, so a lay is a perfect year of education, the best possible year of education you could have. 460 per $100 spent. You can get 460 Singaporean equivalent years what, of what education. What's the program? It's like... So <laughs> magic pills. I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> well, so some of these things are so there are two that come out as sort of spectacularly effective. One is just rearranging kids in a class. So that's why. So you got two classes. So, so it costs basically nothing. It costs basically nothing. You have to test the kids so that you put the kids who are, you know, at grade two in the grade two class and the kids who are at grade four in the grade four class, even though they're the same age. <laughs> right? And they learn much better. So that's, that's why it's so phenomenally cost effective, because, you know, it really doesn't cost anything. And then the other one is about information. So, you know, sort of sending information over the phone, you know, so these really small nudges. Now, none of them transform any kid's life, but they are so cheap that you get these fantastic returns. And we do very little of that. Interesting. Yeah, I guess whenever you have a program that has like zero, close to zero or negative cost, then the benefit to cost ratio becomes a bit meaningless because it's not considering a real cost, which is like attention and like figuring out how to do the program. And I guess political capital that you might spend making it happen. There's a lot of, there's a lot of issues. But a good program in education is like one lay per hundred dollars. There are a bunch that are 10. There are a bunch at 30. There are a bunch, like there are orders of magnitude difference between the best and the good. Yeah. So there's multiple different uh, things here. Uh, what, it sounded a bit like you were saying that most of the return on the like original testing of programs like came from just the, the handful that seemed most cost effective once you scaled them up. So you could also ask like at the like at the point that you if you, let's say you were considering just scaling up all of them individually like how how wide is the range there? But it sounds like the variance would be pretty pretty wild anyway, but like really really very high. But is this true like if you test things multiple times so you're not kind of getting the winners or like you're not getting regression to the mean on like the highest you know accidental measurement? Uh, and also if you consider that like it might it might work very well in some places and then like only moderately. Really well in other places so like all of these things tend to kind of push them bunch them back towards like all having a somewhat more similar impact even then you think it's like extremely high variance across different programs yes okay so um, I, oh, and perhaps also just this fact that uh, often you can get like yeah these little like little programs that cost very little that have amazing benefit to cost ratios but like can't really be scaled up that much or you can't spend that much money on them potentially no. well we can't spend that much money on them but in the in terms of like world gdp yeah. But in terms, certainly as effective altruists, we could spend yeah. all of our money on effective <laughs> altruists and getting yeah. those education information ones out. Yeah. Or, you know, potentially these, you know, mobile phone agriculture things. I mean, they're just so cheap. Yeah. So it's true that you're not probably going to end up spending all of your agricultural budget on mobile extension, but there's huge returns to getting that right, you know, testing to get it so that it is right in you know, designed in a really well, good way. And similarly on these education inf information interventions. And we could spend quite a lot of money on this. And I mean, I, it's slightly, I get slightly frustrated. I had a conversation with, I shouldn't use a name, but, a, <laughs> you know, billionaire, a couple of billionaires who, you know, when we were talking about deworming and they're like, you mean we could just deworm the whole world for, you know, what was small change for them? And we're like, yeah. yes. yes. And they're like, <laughs> yeah, no. That's so disappointing. That's too, that's too <laughs> small. It was like, oh, but you could have said that the fact that it was a small, that that was a small amount of money for them didn't, doesn't mean that they shouldn't just have done it. Yeah. I guess I'm just saying, that, uh, yeah, there's like, if you just take like the, the benefit to cost ratio across like all individual studies and it's like very widely dispersed. And then there's like various things that kind of chop that way a little bit. And the question is like, after all these adjustments, uh, like how like how high is the variance still? It sounds like it is still like very high, even if you've like made some adjustments. So I've this. looked at this a bit in education and, you know, people like David Evans have done things saying, well, look, the costs are really different in different environments. But the order, actually, the rough range of these are really good, these are kind of good and these don't work is pretty consistent just because the orders of magnitude are so big. 
Now, that's not true of all things, but again, these information ones consistently come up as very high. Yeah, because they're so cheap. Because they're so cheap. If they work and they're so cheap. And then I, so I divide things up into this is something which consistently works, you know, in very different environments. You know, the, the information education stuff, you know, US, Chile, Madagascar, like we're getting really different contexts, really di- implemented really different ways, still getting phenomenal returns. Uh, then there's the ones that are hard to implement and they work sometimes and don't work others. And that's so again, in education, because I know it better, paying teachers for results really depends on how well you do it. Like you can really screw that up and get adverse, you know, unintended con- consequences. And then there's a bunch of stuff that like just hasn't worked anywhere ever. We really need to stop doing okay. that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's, let's, let's push on from that. Um, uh, you uh, were not that keen on charter cities, it sounded like. Uh, you kind of said that you think only, only Paul Roma is, uh, is keen on that. Well, I'm kind of keen on charter cities, at least in principle. So I'm curious to know uh, why, why I'm uh, probably overrating them. So I guess, I mean, I should say I haven't spent that much time thinking about it because I just thought that the political economy problems... Okay, right, right. Yeah. ...were just so difficult that... Um, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen, okay, yeah. so I'm not going to spend my time worrying about it. Yeah, okay, that that, that potentially makes sense. And so, you know, there are a lot of there are a lot of really high return things that are difficult political economy, and I'm going to spend my time on that, like getting people to you know charge for carbon. Okay, yeah, okay. So you, uh, so it's basically you got this trade off sometimes between like how easy it is to get something up politically, and then how useful it is. And you just think like, given how like maybe this would be a good idea, but given just the intense like political difficulty of, make, of making it happen, it's not worth it to, to focus on this one. Yeah, yeah basically, uh, yeah. Uh, did you feel the same way about like special economic zones and things like that? Yeah, so that's what I was going to say, right? To some extent, what the argument there is about is you know, you could potentially do half the things he's talking about in a special economic zone. So why not do that? Uh, but I don't know, again, I don't know the literature enough on on the special economic zones. It's quite a hard thing to test. Look, we absolutely know that institutions matter. There's extremely good evidence on that. We also know that they're extremely hard to change. Right? Those are the two things we know. <laughs> that doesn't mean that we shouldn't keep working on ways to practically change them. And I'm all in favor of that. And I've done some work on that. And, you know, whether it's improving democracy or, you know, decentralization or there's all sorts of different things that you can do to try and make institutions more responsive to the needs of the population. And, you know, we know that rule of law is really important because we see that, you know, hundreds of years later, the places that had bad rule of law are still worse off. So we know that that matters. It's not clear to me, given the persistence, it's not clear to me that just putting in place a new framework actually delivers those results. So the best evidence on this kind of r- rule of law and in institutions work is w- is comes from countries where there was different institutions sort of 100, 200, 300 years ago. They are now under exactly the same rule of law, but the places that were under the worst rule of law, you know, 300 years ago and now are still significantly worse off. That suggests to me that just laying a new thing on top is not actually going to solve the problem. I guess there is this interesting thing with uh, if something's very persistent, if basically like this year determines next year, then it's like uh, the impact of trying to change it, it kind of cancels out the fact that it's both very hard to change. But if you did, it would last for ages uh, if you're taking a long-term view. But it does suggest, yeah, that you're going to face like significant headwinds uh, trying, trying to make things any different. Although if you do succeed, then that would be great. Yeah. yeah. And so I think the right thing that we should be thinking about, and maybe Charter Cities is an example of that, but we should be thinking about practical things that we could change and testing about whether they have any impact. It's interesting because some things like quotas for women in India, you would think really long-term discrimination against women, and yet a specific Supreme Court ruling that led to women having more political power, real political power over real money in India had very quick turnaround impacts. On real, you know, on real lives, uh, not just perceptions of women, but actually, you know, improvements in resources and and outcomes within those communities. So, 
yes, it's hard to change things, but there are if we keep testing, there are examples where we have managed to change things. So let's keep looking for those. Yeah. Chris, are, are there any other uh, really high value interventions in gender equality that, that you'd like to highlight? So increasingly, I am getting convinced that the safe spaces for adolescent girls, we now have a number of those with positive effects. We still, again, this is an example where there's one not good one where implementation was poor. Um, is this kind of at schools or at universities or? No, no, no. Uh, this like is like, this is in communities. So I evaluated one in Bangladesh. Uh, their BRAC does a lot of these. Uh, they had an evaluation in Uganda that was very successful. There's just been one in coming out in Sierra Leone where they seem to protect girls from pregnancy during the Ebola crisis. There's a massive increase in adolescent pregnancy during the Ebola crisis. So, so that's something which I think is something definitely we should look at. I think, you know, the standard girls' education, I was always very skeptical because that was based on pretty much no evidence, but now we're building evidence that it actually turns out it was quite a good thing. Uh, family planning, you know, there's quite a bit of evidence from different contexts that allowing access to family planning allows women to, you know, because they have more control in the future, they actually then invest in their education now and they take on different roles and are more likely to work. And it's sort of that forward looking, if you reduce the costs, you know, if you don't have family planning, you know, you're going to be having kids forever and there's no point in going to school. There's no point investing in other human capital. So I think that's pretty general too. Yeah, if you uh, could advise like Narendra Modi, the, the PM of India, on like one one policy issue and like hopefully get him take you to take you quite seriously, uh, what what do you think you would you would talk about in that in that meeting? I would try and persuade him. So this is assuming, yeah, that he would listen. Yeah. It, Setting aside yeah. political reality, maybe. Yes. Uh, okay. is, is the spirit of yes. the question. Yeah. Okay. So I would uh, try and persuade him to put in place a market for carbon. Oh, interesting. Really? In, okay. In, explain that. Sorry. <laughs> I, I didn't expect that. <laughs> right. Um, for a couple of reasons. So one is just, you know, climate change is going to have huge impacts on the poor. And India is a big emitter of carbon. I firmly believe that if you get prices right, people, there's lots of things that people would do differently if the price that are reasonably cheap, but we've so screwed up prices that they don't have the incentive to do it. So some music to my ears as an economist, but <laughs> carry on. So I think that's one, you know, if you're looking for one thing that would then set the right incentives throughout the system. And the final point is the health impacts in India of burning coal are just extraordinary. Unbelievable health costs of all those coal fire power Yeah, I was listening to a radio program the other day that was saying that it was taking about 10 years off the average life of people in like some of these cities like Delhi or Mumbai. So it's like, it's like they're the equivalent of smoking cigarettes, maybe even more so, which is absolutely crazy. Yes, it's, you, it's the equivalent of heavy smoking every day. And you think about kids breathing that in. Yeah, the air pollution thing makes sort of sense. But wouldn't you then perhaps want to put in a program that just like taxes air pollution? Or do you think that like taxing, taxing coal comes pretty close to doing that or taxing uh, carbon in general is pretty close to an air pollution tax? So I would also love to do stuff on, on pollution, but a lot of this is coming from coal and obviously then you also have climate impacts. I mean, I'd have to work through the, you know, I haven't gone through all the detailed numbers of how much of those particulates are coming from coal and how much are coming from other things, but the, the double whammy of... Mm. Both climate change and saving just very large numbers of lives. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. On this program, they were talking about uh, people who were trying to create like citywide like air purification so that you'd build buildings that would suck up air from the surrounding city and then purify it. Uh, like basically like the same thing that you have in your house, but like a, a wow. building that does that. Wow. Uh, yeah. Uh, it sounded like it potentially might work, but it's perhaps too expensive for, for India to, to scale. Well, they, they there's be... a relatively easy <laughs> <laughs> Maybe stick a filter on the, uh, on the plant the, itself. The crazy but... thing is that it's not that much more expensive to build a solar power station now yeah. versus a coal power. And if you add it in the health costs, let alone the environmental costs, it's so much cheaper. One thing that you uh, spoke very positively about was um, helping to stop illicit financial flows. Is that something that listeners can potentially help with in their career? Or is that something that it's, it's really a matter for you know, governments in the developing world to, to, to work on or yeah, you know, locals? 
I suppose potentially we could try to reform policy in the US and UK and Australia, right? If, if in as much as we're helping with some of these illicit financial flows, which I've heard we do. Yeah. So I think that a lot of these illicit financial flows th- flow through us. Um, in general, people in the West are, you know, better at influencing policy. Well, I don't know, but it, in some ways, <laughs> it can be easier to influence policy in your home country. You have to spend a lot of time understanding the political economy if you try and influence policy elsewhere. So I think that's absolutely something that we should th- be thinking about. Again, I haven't done a full cost-benefit analysis, but if you think about the money that's coming out, you think about how it's distorting policy decisions. Interesting. Because In the development world? You yes. Mean? Okay, yeah. So, so yes. programs are being designed such that like money can be siphoned off, is that what you mean? Or like yeah. decisions are made based on what will facilitate corruption? So, for example... Uh, Mozambique is now in a massive debt problem because it took on a highly corrupt loan which was laundered in London. If that loan hadn't happened, you know, Mozambique would have an awful lot more money Mm. to spend on poverty relief. So the money was just stolen outright, more or less? It was like siphoned off in some way through like banks in London? So there were a lot of deals that are done uh, and a lot of poor policy decisions are made, including, you know, building coal fire plants instead of solar ones because someone is, you know, given money to do that. Now, stopping the illegal flows out of the country doesn't, like, they could still benefit from the corruption internally, but a lot of that money does go outside the country. So a lot of people worry about it saying, well, that money could be invested in the country. I don't think that's the main benefit. I think the main benefit is if we could get to a point where policies, decisions in countries were based on what was good for the country. So you could have more transparency locally, but it's actually potentially easier to have transparency wider because a lot of this money then does go into bank accounts in the West. And if people knew that there was a risk that they wouldn't be able to keep that money because someone would confiscate it, that would reduce the likelihood that they would take that, that, yeah, it would change incentives, exactly. Uh, so the other day you talked pretty positively about, you know, the potentially massive returns you get when a country is, got, is open to major economic reform and you go out and, you know, say, yeah, this is how you ought to structure markets uh, based, on, based on what we know. How crazy would it be to just design Diffid to just like wait around for like for whatever countries are open to like massive economic reform at that point and then just like flying in tons of people to try to give the best possible advice on, on, on that question? If that's kind of the, the the program that has the biggest benefit to cost ratio, but like, you know, at any point in time, there's only like two countries in the world that are receptive to that kind of advice. Maybe you should just be like waiting around and flying to those two countries like between them. Well, that kind of assumes that you can fly in and give advice without knowing the country. And also the pouring in the money doesn't, you know, cause problems in yeah. some way. But I, but I recognize there's some downsides <laughs> to this to this proposal. Yeah, but but I absolutely am advocating that we should be more flexible and in cert- certainly put people. You know, so for example, you know, I mentioned Ethiopia is somewhere where massive change is happening at the moment, and I think we ought to absolutely be doing what we can. Now, there's a question of is it DFID? Is it the World Bank? Do we give the right advice? Because sometimes what happens is. You know, you get to the end of the world, the, uh, the world <laughs> end of a war, yeah. and we fly in lots of experts who don't know anything about the country and say, "Okay, here's a you know your forest regulation was the example being given earlier today. Your forest regulation, you know, should be this." And we you know give them the UK's yeah. forest regulation, which you know they're <laughs> may not, not gonna, have may good not. external validity. <laughs> yes. Exactly. So you got to do it smart. But if you think about what we did, I'm old enough to be have been around when we were giving advice post the end of the Cold War. Seems like we screwed the pooch on that one, right? Or is that not the case? No, I mean look at look at there are a lot of countries that were you know in really dire straits and moved to market economies. Okay, so and, like in Eastern Europe, you mean like Poland, perhaps, or yeah. You know, now Russia has maybe not been such a success. Yeah. Um, I guess uh, uh, people blame us, I think, for the oligarch problem that like all of these public assets were like sold off for next to nothing, and then a bunch of people became really rich, and now they control the politics. And so yep. like, there were some some problems, even if there were some wins as well. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So I think yeah. yes, exactly. I think some countries w- it, this was done better than others. All right, let's let's push on to some uh, career related questions, uh, like advice that um, potentially listeners can take. 
So you've been at Diffid for about nine months now, nine, ten months. Yeah. It, do you have any kind of stories where, where you think your, your presence has, has made a difference already that, that you can potentially talk about publicly? Or is it maybe too yeah. soon for that or like it's too sensitive? So the first piece of advice on policy influence is never claim credit. Always make someone think that they did it. <laughs> Um, right, we'll, we'll, we'll bleep out all the specifics. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, so I was thinking about what, what would be, what I can say is where I've given some, some advice and, you know, I'm not at all saying that it was because of me that this happened, but, but it, it's an example of where having done analysis can help inform a decision, right? I think that's the right way to think about it. So I, I had spent a lot of time working on Sierra Leone in the past. Um, you know, I know their data quite well. I So it was one of the DFID countries that I went to visit. Um, it wasn't so much actually influencing what DFID was doing, but I, I was talking to the World Bank and the IMF about their programs. And one of the conditions that the World Bank had had, so there was a big need to increase revenue. And uh, they had been asking for a long time for the government to increase the revenue from fossil fuels, so from from petrol. So they massively subsidized petrol. So really bad for the environment, really bad distributional impacts, you know, really bad for their revenues. You know, they were spending way, way, loads of money on this. So that was fine. But then the second thing they were talking about, and was originally a bank condition, was to increase the excise tax on rice imports. And I was able to say, or, you know, I, I argued with them saying, look, you're increasing fuel prices. Fuel prices is actually a big part of the cost of food in rural areas because you're shipping in the hungry season. You are about to enter the hungry season. Uh, you know, and I look, showed data about what happens to the price of food, what happened, you know, 90% of or plus of people are are hungry in Sierra Leone, skip meals in Sierra Leone in August. You do not want to be raising the price of of rice <laughs> in August. And it actually it's imported rice that people eat in August. So that didn't happen. I don't know whether it was because of the evidence that I showed, but that seems like a pretty big policy. Uh, it seems like it was open, you know, you could bring some data to bear on it. Even if you're going to do it, don't do it. <laughs> don't do it, you know, two whammies at a time when people are literally starving. So um, so that's the kind of thing where I think, you know, it's not an RCT, it's just basic data of looking at kind of seasonality. And also, you know, the argument was, well, people in the rural areas don't eat imported rice. Well, actually, in August, they do. So just having kind of these basic descriptive data was actually, I think, quite important. Uh, so there's uh, two projects in the effective altruism community, uh, Charity Science Health and Charity Entrepreneurship, that have uh, actually um, started, started programs in the developing world uh, focused on uh, micronutrient supplementation, I think, and also vaccination reminders. I've, I've been trying to like draw out if there's any like interventions that you think are particularly underrated that it could be really useful for uh, you know people to work on on scaling up or delivering or testing. Uh, but yeah, are there, are there any others that I haven't come up that you would like to to flag as uh, potentially uh, good options for for listeners to yeah to try to deliver themselves or to talk to other people about? So that's a good question. I do think there are not enough. I think there are not enough organisations <laughs> that take one thing and try and push that one thing at scale. You know, really iterate and and try and do it at scale. You know, some of this education information stuff might be an example of that. I know effective altruists kind of sometimes have questions about education. Is is there strong enough evidence that education is a good thing? But if within, if you care about education, I think that's a big thing to do. And there are people working on that. I mean, I have to think a little bit more about, I don't have off the top of my head a list of of things that I think we ought to be doing more of. It's 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 interesting though because it is the case that DFIDs can't do most of these things, and sometimes when we say, "Well, look, there's evidence that this is a really good thing," can we commission someone to do it? And there aren't organisations there, but they need to be at scale, and that's the thing that I worry about. Right? Is it's no good being a small implementer doing this? It, it, certainly, in terms of us being able to commission, like we commission sort of. 50 million, you know, our, our project on 
I was looking at recently a proposal for, you know, 170 million on education in Nigeria. And so that's a bit of the hurdle of a factor of actress starting their own organizations to do this versus sort of joining another organization. The trade-off is some of those other organizations, you know, don't want to do one thing. They want to do all kinds of different, all kinds of different things. And I don't mind people doing all kinds of different projects like Evidence Action does a number of different, but they'll only do one at a time. So they take a lot of different evidence-based things and turn them into scale programs. But they don't think that in order to do deworming, you also have to do toilets and training and shoes and right, they just do the deworming because that's the thing that the evidence is. It is just really weird that there's this culture of yeah, wanting to have uh, programs that like, kind of are holistic that do everything because you don't, for example, find that like Starbucks wants to like also scale up and like run hospitals or run all kinds of different uh, like products at the same time. Like typically, like a business like tries to nail like one product really well at a time, but that, that doesn't seem to exist as much. So I think there's some very specific. I've I've been thinking a lot about this since I've been at Diffid, and I think there's some very specific incentives within the system, which is. If you want to be able to show people your project working, if you've, say, done a really cheap thing that makes people, millions of people marginally better off, you've got nothing to show, nothing to take pictures off, nothing to take a minister to. Right. So it's like a portfolio of things that like look good and things that are useful, uh, like more, more, more on the looking good and more on the useful And then maybe side. it's also, but it's also, I think, partly a, in our individual psychology, we were, if we're supporting a school, we want to go to a school where the kids are looking happy and they're well fed and, and there's a roof on the classroom and that, you know, as opposed to, well, they got a text reminder and they're 10% more likely to be in school. Yeah. <laughs> well, that doesn't so, give you, sure, yeah. maybe that well, doesn't give Well, it does to me, it does to me. It does to you. <laughs> Warms my heart. <laughs> yes, but it, unfortunately, there's a psychological thing, which is there are a lot of people who don't think in numbers and it doesn't work for them. So we're, co- so I was working, you know, I've been working on some political stuff and and the, our, the implementers we work with just really want to do it beautifully in like three villages. And we're trying to say, no, no. whole country, yeah. whole country. <laughs> <laughs> How do you do this for the whole country? And there's hmm. something in the development community. So there's, two, there's a number of different factors. There's something going on, which I haven't quite understood, but I have some insights into as to why people want it to be perfect in a few places rather than kind of okay or slightly better everywhere. There's also a fundamental belief in the development community that fixing one hurdle doesn't work, that people need all of the hurdles removed. Yeah, Yeah. and sometimes that's true. Sometimes you get complementarity, but it's not always the case. And you also get loss, loss of specialization. And I think part of the problem has been evaluations that say, that go in and say, well, this program didn't work. Evaluations being not kind of RCTs, but the more qualitative evaluation, which goes in and says, well, this program didn't seem to be working. Why is that? Well, that's because there was this other barrier. And maybe it's just it didn't work. Maybe just those kinds of things just don't work. But then if you read all those evaluation reports, you would say, we have to do all of these things together. Last few questions. Uh, what, what were the best decisions that you've made in your career in retrospect? So I guess I moved out of domestic policy and into, into development. And I think that was a good move. I'm not saying it's right for everyone, but I think the amount of impact that you can have in development is really big. And I put the investment in to getting more economics and more ability to do data analysis. And I think that paid off. Um, there was a time when I thought, oh, you know, I can muddle by with what I've got. But I ended up putting, you know, considerably more investment in learning the tools. And while I was learning them, part of me was thinking, I'm never going to use this. But just kind of mastering it meant that I just went up a level in my ability to, you know, think through the ideas. And and I think that was a good investment for me. Yeah, that's one I hear fairly often. I know there's uh, quite a lot of listeners who are kind of early on in their careers in the civil service in various countries. Do you have any general general advice for, for them? How potentially they can go further or have more impact? Yeah, so I am a big fan of the civil service. Like that's where I started life. I would have stayed forever if I hadn't met Michael and, you know, he persuaded me to move to the States. You can end up having a lot of influence, at least in the kind of British style, uh, you know, Britain, India, Pakistan. I mean, the places where, that I know, the US, you sometimes 
it can sometimes be harder because a lot of the top jobs go to political appointees. What I would say, though, is that sometimes it's hard to keep up on the literature, especially, you know, as an economist. And I worry that people kind of read the things that are easier to read and the things, you know, they Google what's the... And the think tanks, you know, are very good at putting out reports that Looks seem... Looks splashy and... You know. Yeah, they look splashy. They also are designed to look like they're answering the question that you want answered, but they're doing it badly because they're constantly looking at what the civil service, what the government, what are the key words, and they're doing reports on that. And so coming back into the civil service, I'm trying to push people to say, no, don't read the think tank report. Let's stay up on like... Read the, the paper. Read the paper, right? Because often the think tank report is... Now, I, look, I'm not trying to dismiss all think tanks. I'm using that as a general, like, don't read the thing that is a cross-country regression or the back-of-the-envelope estimate in a glossy, like, you know, read the serious... Now, maybe it's an, an overview of the serious research, but try and keep up on that. And I have colleagues in my unit who, you know, are reading the top economics journal. I don't know where they find the time, but somehow they do. And they're up to date on those things. And I think that just is really hard to do, but really important in terms of if you're thinking about this, you know, 80,000 hours question of, you know, my marginal benefit versus the, you know, someone else who could put... You know, make sure you're that marginally better person by making sure that, you know, you stay up to date on what is the best evidence. Uh, yeah. In the other interview, uh, you mentioned that you were uh, you thought that starting a successful business in the developing world was potentially underrated. Do you know of any instances of, you know, people from the US or the UK or Australia actually going and managing to successfully do this in a developing country who uh, people could learn from? Just the names of the businesses would be plenty, I think, to go and study them. I mean, I know people who started businesses. It's a bit early on to say whether they've really changed things. This is partly coming from the literature showing that there's huge potential improvements in productivity in most companies in the developing world, like some simple basic improvements in management practices uh, could massively improve things. Now, maybe I'm wrong that someone coming with, you know, a lot of analytical background would be able to, you know, help push those through those management practices through. But certainly the evidence is there that there's a lot of scale. There's a lot of low hanging fruit. There's a lot of low hanging fruit in, in businesses. And we know that the poor want jobs. They don't want to run their own firms. They want a job in somebody else's firm. So we know that. And also just what I've been able to see in when we work with partners, some of the basic things that we can do to improve their MI system. Basically, we do this in order to get the ability to, you know, we researchers do this in return for them agreeing to randomize. And I can tell you, we do massive improvements on, you know, people's data systems, you know, on their basic decision making once we're in partnership. So that's where my idea came from. If you were inside those organizations, you could potentially, you know, and you came with good analytical skills and good coding and, you know, ability to build a better MI system. I think there's huge potential there if you found the right group who kind of wanted to take you on. Yeah, I think I know some of the reports that you're referring to there. They're like quite eye-opening. So I'll try to find them and stick up links to them for, for listeners to take a look at. Uh, so just one last question is like uh, pretty often like civil servants can find that it's hard to lobby for something internally without kind of an external push to like interest politicians or perhaps yeah, political appointees within the civil service. Uh, is there anything that listeners can kind of push for that would potentially help you in your, in, in your job at Diffit? Okay, so you've just said that I'm not allowed to say that. Oh, interesting. Okay. <laughs> So I well, think the answer has to be... Um, well, you might be able to say that, you know, here's something that I support that like other people are not necessarily that interested in within the institution. Or well, I mean, just in general, there is an awful lot of, you know, bad rhetoric around aid that is just misinformed and, you know, get out there and be part of that debate. I think in particular, telling the story of the improvements that we have seen, like, the majority of the populations in the countries that we live in think that the poor are getting poorer and they don't know that and that actually, aid doesn't work and that aid doesn't work and i'm not saying that all aid works or whatever but they but they're saying we put all this money in and people are still poor <laughs> like 
We didn't put that much money in and things have gotten a lot better. (laughs) Exactly. So, you know, go out and tell some successes, I think is kind of pretty important, actually. Fantastic. Well, my guest today has been Rachel Glenister. I'm so glad we got time for a second session here. So thanks for coming on the show. (laughs) Thank you. I contacted uh, Eva Vavout uh, about this episode just before it came out uh, to find out if there was anything she wanted to add on to the end of the episode in, in response to what uh, Rachel was saying. Uh, and she, she wrote uh, this response, which, which I'll just uh, briefly read out here. I think Rachel and I are mostly on the same side. I would agree that results from different studies tend to be very heterogeneous. And my paper, How Much Can We Generalize from Impact Evaluations, highlights this. Unfortunately, many organizations continue to act as though there is one true effect of a given intervention on a given outcome that holds everywhere. And I think my paper should be read as, in part, a reaction to this. In terms of modeling the effects, I agree that careful models could help. Though, practically speaking, it's going to be hard to build good models when you have got very few studies to draw upon. That's where you may need to rely more on priors. And it was great to see Rachel referencing Stefano Della Vigna's work with Devin Pope on this because I'm currently collaborating with Stefano on building a platform to help gather ex-ante forecasts of social science results more systematically. We're trying to solve the coordination problem that we see brewing, whereby if a lot of researchers start independently soliciting priors, it could become a huge burden on expert forecasters. Another advantage of the platform is that it provides third-party, credible timestamps of when predictions were gathered and transmitted back to researchers. I think there's a lot we still have to learn about when we can trust our ex-ante predictions, but I'm very excited about the potential for this line of work to shed some light on that question. Thanks so much to Eva for writing that quick response, and I'm sure we'll hear more about this debate uh, in future. Just a reminder about the Future Perfect and Future of Life podcasts, which you can subscribe to right now if this show isn't quite enough for you. As always, we've linked to a range of papers and reports that Rachel referred to throughout the episode in the blog post associated with the show. I'd strongly encourage you to check out the resources we put together for people who want to learn more from time to time when you're particularly into an episode. We link to that blog post in the show notes, which you can access from within your podcasting app. The 80,000 Hours podcast is produced by Kieran Harris. Thanks for joining. Talk to you in a week or two.